Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be aware that this series may contain images, voices or names of deceased persons. Welcome to Susan Carland In Conversation. This interview is a supplement to episode 10 in the Australian Journey series, Creating a Nation. We are at the National Centre for Australian Studies at Monash University today, and joining us is one of the centre's leading researchers, Professor Jenny Hocking. Jenny, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Susan. Jenny has written some of the most important accounts of the political life here in Australia, including this prize-winning biography of the Labor Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam. Gough Whitlam was arguably one of the most progressive and most controversial leaders in this country. His parliamentary career lasted as Prime Minister barely three years, and yet he enacted significant change in this country. Jenny, in your book, you described his um, legislation as astounding. What did you mean by that? Well, it's just significant in terms of the number of pieces of legislation, but also the nature of the legislation. I mean, it was just far reaching in every single aspect of Australian society. I mean, I often describe this period as a period that really made modern Australia. And there's not a single aspect of Australian society that remained untouched from the Whitlam government. So it, it, we could go through things such as the electoral law reforms, the fact that 18 year olds got the vote for the first time under the Whitlam government. Another key plank was equal electorate size, so electorate uh, equality under the Whitlam government. I mean, the Northern Territory and ACT didn't even have Senate representation until the Whitlam government. So on so many levels for women, for Indigenous people, um, recognition, for example, of uh, Communist China uh, ending uh, our last remaining uh, connection to the Vietnam War. And the very first uh, decision of the Whitlam government that I think is highly symbolic and really important was to release from prison young men who had refused to go to Vietnam to fight in that very unpopular war and who had been in prison for up to two years. So a range of activities and depending on where you want to start, we could go into them in more detail, but it was really the most far ranging three years of change in our history. So, well, then let's start with foreign policy. What did he change for Australia in terms of its nearest neighbours? Well, as I said, he recognised, the Whitlam government recognised communist China, and that was an absolute landmark. And in China, Gough Whitlam is still really a, a revered figure because he'd also made a visit as leader of the opposition to China just in about the previous year prior to actually coming into office. And that was a very brave, courageous, and to many people, a foolhardy decision to make. But it put Whitlam on the map as an international statesman. It put our relationship with one of our nearest and uh, most important neighbours uh, very much at the forefront. But you can also see in the way in which he received visits from overseas that he was really changing our traditional deference and relationship to Britain and Europe. For example, the first international visitor he welcomed was the Chief Minister of Papua New Guinea, who was Michael Samari. And that was a very important symbolic move as well. And the key decision that, that they reached was that uh, a PNG would have independence within a three-year time period. And in fact, the Whitlam government delivered on that, and that was, that was achieved by September 1975. Um, we also saw a, an opening up of relations, I think, in many areas uh, in the Pacific and in our immediate region. And more importantly, on a global sense, um, Australia came back to what it had once had in the immediate post-war period of a much more independent, autonomous stance while recognising our traditional ties to both Britain and America, but a stand that was very much its own independent and its own recognition of its own interests that may not always coincide with the interests of America and England. And one other thing I must say is that we had very, very strong relations with New Zealand during the time of the Whitlam government. The high point, I think, of that relationship with New Zealand was when Australia and New Zealand joined forces to take France to the International Court of Justice against the nuclear tests in the Pacific, and a very significant victory in forcing the French, French to move those, um, those tests underwater and underground at that time. So a series of changes in our relationships with uh, both our immediate neighbours and our more traditional relationships. So obviously a profound amount of change in just three years internationally. What about domestically? What were some of the things that were achieved here? 
Well, again, the domestic changes were just immense, um, particularly in the areas, I think, for women, for Indigenous people. One of the very earliest uh, decisions of the Whitlam government was to reopen the equal pay case that was then before the Conciliation and Arbitration Commission. The previous government had not supported a move to equal pay. Uh, the Whitlam government immediately reopened that case, and the case was argued by a young Sydney barrister, Mary Gordon, who later succeeded to uh, the High Court herself as our first woman uh, High Court Justice. It was um, a victory at the court for, for um, equal pay. And other than that, the Whitlam government made many, many decisions that impacted on women, sometimes in indirect ways and often in very direct ways. Um, one was their uh, changes to education in particular, in which women in huge numbers took up the possibility of free tertiary education and return to university study in great numbers. That was a hugely significant change for people across the board. The amount of money, the federal money that was put into education, particularly the fact that there were no fees for tertiary education, whether colleges and university uh, education, that affected women in particular. But more than that, we saw women appointed to senior positions in a way that hadn't ever been the case previously. One was the appointment of uh, Justice Elizabeth Everett to the Conciliation and Arbitration Commission and also as the first Justice of the Family Court of Australia. These were really significant appointments. Um, we also saw the appointment for the first time of a Prime Minister's advisor uh, on the status of women being Elizabeth Reid. So a very significant series of changes for women that changed the position of women uh, dramatically. And probably the most significant I must point to in that respect was in the introduction of no-fault divorce. For many years, divorce in Australia had been only possible if there was evidence of fault. And this was a terrible notion in the law in which um, women frequently ended up in a position where they lost access to their children if they sought to leave a marriage. So the advent of no-fault divorce was extremely important in enabling women to leave unhappy marriages, marriages that were at times perhaps violent. And one of the interesting things when I finished the biography was the number of women who rang, for example, on talkback radio and recalled the change in their circumstances that occurred at the time of the Whitlam government, often through a combination of their capacity to leave an unhappy marriage and to get a better education by returning to university. So I think for women, those two things in particular, perhaps even more than the equal pay, really dramatically changed their lives. Mm. What, was there any significance for Indigenous people during this time? Oh, highly significant. Again, uh, the Whitlam government was one that was very active in ensuring that Indigenous rights were also recognised. Just prior to the election of the Whitlam government, uh, a tent embassy had been established on the lawns of uh, opposite old Parliament House, which remains there today. And it, it created great consternation at the time, and it's interesting to go back and have a look at the, at the coverage of that time. Now, Gough Whitlam was the only um, leader of one of the major parties to actually go there, to sit down with the Indigenous people, to talk to them about what it was they were seeking and what areas um, his forthcoming government could actually act. Um, I think one of the most important things there was the establishment of the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. So for the first time, we had an actual departmental uh, primacy given to Indigenous Affairs in Australia, and that was a very important decision. Um, a, a, another one, I think, was the Racial Discrimination Act. This was a really significant move by the Whitlam government. Uh, it was passed barely months prior to the, the, the Whitlam government falling in 1975. And we see later with the Mabo decision that that decision could not have held had it not been for the existence of the Racial Discrimination Act because there are actually two Mabo decisions, Mabo No. 1 in Queensland, Mabo No. 2, the major one that we're aware of. But had uh, Mabo No. 1 succeeded in Queensland, um, the case itself would have fallen over. Now, it was the existence of the Racial Discrimination Act that ensured that that attempt by the Queensland government to railroad the Mabo case from the very earliest days was actually over, uh, overcome. Uh, so that was a very important decision, and it meant an end to discriminatory practices. It effectively meant that we could no longer discriminate um, against uh, anybody or any, any person on the grounds of race or, 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 or religion and so on. Um, and so that was a very important decision as well for Indigenous people. But the most important one, I think, was towards the end of the Whitlam government when uh, we had the first bill and the first national legislation put forward to recognise Indigenous land rights with the Northern Territory Land Rights Bill. So that was an extremely important bill. 
um, which was later taken over by the Fraser government and passed in a slightly different form. But that was the first time we had federally an attempt to legislate for, for land rights. And of course we saw the Whitlam government oversee the passing on to the, um, uh, at Dagaragu, to the Gurindji people, their traditional lands um, at Wave Hill. So it was an extremely important time for the development of Indigenous rights as well. And the Labor government won the 1972 election in a landslide, which suggests to the people of Australia, they really saw that it was time for a change. It, it, it had been a long period of, of conservative government in Australia, and I think that's really important for how you understand what happened to the Whitlam government. For 23 years, we'd had nothing but conservative government. So this sense of change was both built up and necessary, but also in some quarters, uh, very concerning because people had not been used to a Labor government. There hadn't been a Labor government for nearly two generations. So the advent of the Labor government was seen as something that was it was time for, and in fact its time was the, the famous uh, theme song, and it was the theme of the campaign proper for the Whitlam government as it came into office, and it was a very successful one. But the landslide was actually achieved over two electoral cycles. The 1969 election had really um, secured, I think, a 7% swing towards Labor, and then the 1972 election was more like a 3% swing. So together, they constituted a very significant shift in the Australian landscape. So certainly people felt it was time for a change, we needed change, things had become moribund over the previous 23 years, and there was a lot of support for that change. And how did the Conservative opposition, the Liberal Party and the National Party, how did they respond to this new almost revolutionary party that was coming in? Well, from the outset, the, the what was then the opposition parties, which were not used to a period in opposition, they'd had nothing but government for the previous 23 years, but the now opposition Liberal Country Party coalition met the Whitlam government with nothing but disrespect, horror, and a refusal to accept the legitimacy of the government. And again, I think this is extremely important, really from the outset, the, the, the new opposition simply would not acknowledge the electoral success of the Whitlam government and vowed from the beginning that they would use their then majority in the Senate to prevent them succeeded, succeeding in having their legislative pro program through the parliament. Um, from the very beginning, the, the, the Senate leader uh, for the Liberal Party, Senator, Senator Reg Withers, described the uh, electoral success of the Whitlam government in the 1972 election as nothing but a temporary insanity of the Australian electorate. So it was both disrespectful of the new government, but it was also disrespectful of the Australian people. It was disrespectful of the democratic decision of the Australian people that they wanted change, that they wanted to bring in a new government. But it was unsettling as well. It was sending out a, a sign that the opposition parties, the conservative opposition parties, would do everything they possibly could to stymie the electoral program of the Whitlam government. And what's important to remember here is that that electoral program had actually been put very clearly and very straightforwardly to the Australian people. The It's Time campaign had set out, not just in 72, but also in 69, a very clear blueprint for change. There was not a single part of that program that was not contained and put to the Australian people in the electoral speech, the policy speech of 1972 and 69. So there was no way in which it could be claimed that the Australian electorate was not aware of the series of changes that were going to come in. And it was really, I think, quite concerning to see the extent to which obstruction and a determination to reject that in a parliamentary sense was then put in place, because that's what's happened. And I suppose it's important also to recall that what's remarkable about the legislative success of the Whitlam government is that not only was more legislation passed during those three short years than at any other time in our history, but more legislation was also blocked and rejected in the Senate than in the entire 72 years prior to that since Federation. So you had an extreme in both Houses of Parliament in which the Senate was highly obstructionist, at least until 74 when the numbers changed, and uh, the House of Representatives was extremely productive and was putting forward a major series of changes that by and large with the Whitlam government succeeded in getting through. So in 1975, Senate blocked supply. Tell, what does that mean and what was the significance of that? 
Well, the Whitlam government was re-elected in 1974, and that's an election that's often forgotten. Because Whitlam had a three-year period in office, I think many people think, well, he came to office in 72 and he left in 75. But in fact, the, 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 the Whitlam government was re-elected in a very important election in 1974. It was important because it was a double dissolution election, and there's been very few of them in our history. And it's the only one of those double dissolution elections to not only be returned, but to be returned with enough numbers to actually pass then the legislation that had previously been blocked. And that's called a joint sitting of both Houses of Parliament. It's the only one we've ever had in our history, held in August 1974. And some very important parts of the Whitlam legislative program were passed at that joint sitting, including the bills that later became Medicare. So our universal health scheme, which is another of the extremely important Whitlam government initiatives, and really a model that is looked on with great favour around the world now, um, came in through, through that joint sitting and through the uh, re-election of the Whitlam government in 1974. And the Whitlam government on being returned in 74 picked up three new Senate seats. And what was so critically important at that election was that it came back with equal numbers with the coalition in the Senate. So it meant that the Senate could not now um, act as it had been previously in overturning so many of the bills. It was much more difficult for the opposition to overturn bills. When it came to the blockage of supply, as it's now called, that's gone into our political vernacular, the supply bills had never been blocked in this way previously in our history. It's unprecedented for a government to be denied supply. Um, as our government was, the Whitlam government in 1975. I hasten to say that supply was never rejected. The supply bills were never actually voted on. What happened is that the Senate simply refused to vote on those bills. The opposition had the numbers to keep returning the bills um, and not voting on them. So, as Gough Whitlam said, the Senate has gone on strike <laughs> and, and we had this blockage rather than a rejection. So it was a political play out in, in between the two houses at this point. Um, it was really significant because it meant that the will of the people expressed through what's called the People's House, that is the House of Representatives, was being rejected here by the Senate, which is not voted according to one vote, one value or equal electorate size. It's voted according to state divisions. Um, so as I said, it's the first time that's ever happened in our history, the government uh, had to reach a decision on how to manage this. And the government had reached a decision, and the decision was to hold a half-Senate election. So Gough Whitlam had, by early November 1975, discussed with the Governor-General holding a half-Senate election, and that was his intention to announce on the 11th of November 1975. And supply, of course, is granting funds to the government. All of this came to a head with the dismissal of the elected leader of this country. Um, this was brought about by the Queen's Vicegerent, the Governor-General. In your opinion, did John Kerr act illegally or unconstitutionally? Look, I think this is one of the remaining key questions over the whole end of the Whitlam government. I mean, the notion that a Governor-General who is, after all, an appointed official who has no electoral mandate and no connection to the electoral process, is appointed by, on the advice of the Prime Minister, um, can actually remove a popularly elected government is an affront to all of our understandings of a parliamentary system and a parliamentary re representative democracy such as Australia is. At all times, it has to be remembered that Gough Whitlam retained the confidence of the House of Representatives. So for the Governor-General to receive him, as he did on the 11th of November 1975, with Whitlam anticipating calling the half-Senate election, of which the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, had been aware was Whitlam's intention for the previous five or six days, is really, I find, extremely, extremely troubling. Um, it was a shock to Whitlam, and that's an understatement. He was utterly unprepared for that. He described it as an ambush because he had in his hand a letter of advice to the Governor-General, discussed with the Governor-General that just that morning on the phone when they arranged their meeting to call the half-Senate election. And there's absolutely no doubt had the half-Senate election been called as Whitlam planned to announce in the House of Representatives that afternoon, and in fact his motion can be found in the, in the National Archives where it is written on it, not used, because he was dismissed. But that was the intention and that was the plan and that would have been the end of what was seen as a political crisis with the withholding of supply or the money in order to run government that had taken place in the Senate. So it's an unprecedented action. It's one that, in my view, is utterly improper. 
and quite possibly unconstitutional, although of course it was never tested in the courts at the time. The Governor-General in doing this claimed to have relied on what are called reserve powers, but reserve powers are not to be found in our Constitution. And I think there's a fundamental uh, misunderstanding between political figures and legal figures as to just what constitute reserve powers. To many people, reserve powers seem to be whenever a Governor-General makes an individual decision. But the Governor-General has no active powers he or she has no active powers vested in them other than to act on advice and on the advice of the elected representatives, in particular the Prime Minister. So what Sir John Kerr did is deeply disturbing on a number of levels. Even more disturbing, I find, is that we often forget that the House of Representatives continued to sit in the afternoon of November the 11th, 1975. The House of Representatives, about two hours after the dismissal of the Whitlam government, passed a motion of no confidence in the putative government, the, the appointed government, you might say, of Malcolm Fraser, a man who had led his party to defeat at the previous election, who did not have the support and the confidence of the House of Representatives. Now, Malcolm Fraser lost a motion of confidence by 10 votes, and that same motion called on the Governor-General to reinstate a government led by the member for Werra, that is, Gough Whitnam. Now, I find even more appalling than the dismissal of the Whitnam government what I have called the second dismissal, which is the dismissal of the parliament itself by Sir John Kerr. He simply refused to recognise that motion from the House of Representatives. And what he was doing here was dispelling our elected representatives, their decision as to who was to govern, which is in effect our decision as electors as to who is to form government, and instead appointing a government of his own choice. So it was a truly shocking set of decisions in so many levels, and it remains debated about today for that reason, that it's an affront to the way in which we operate as a, as a democratic nation under a parliamentary system, under the Westminster system. It's never happened previously. Uh, and Malcolm Fraser remained in office, despite the fact that the House of Representatives had passed a motion of no confidence in him. And he went to the election that was then held with all of the benefits of incumbency that should have been given to the Whitlam government. How much do you think Malcolm Fraser knew about what was happening with the Governor-General? I have no doubt that Malcolm Fraser knew very clearly what direction the Governor-General was going in. And one of the great, I think, areas of concern and, and, and really disturbing um, history of this is that the history has been so poorly understood for the best part of four decades. And what I found in my research as I opened up archives that hadn't previously been seen and interviews with individuals who left those interviews to deliberately to be opened up after their death, who did not want to be there to see the uproar that would follow from their revelations during their lifetime, do, do show that there was far more knowledge from both the opposition at the time, that is Malcolm Fraser and his immediate circle, far greater knowledge among individuals on the High Court, for example, than we ever understood. And I think this is really troubling that we had a government that had been uh, elected to office being treated by its Governor-General and by the other heads of institutions that are central to the notion of governance, not just government but governance in Australia, the system of government as a whole, really working against an elected government in that way. Reg Withers, whose disparaging comments I mentioned earlier where he dismissed the electoral result in 1972 as a temporary electoral aberration, um, also left a posthumous interview which was to be released after his death. And in that he makes it very clear that he understood that Sir John Kerr had been in secret contact with Malcolm Fraser in the week before dismissing the Whitlam government and that there was a secret line on which Reg Withers uh, overheard a conversation between Fraser and, and uh, Sir John Kerr. And these were co communications that both uh, Sir John Kerr, the Governor-General, and Malcolm Fraser as, as leader of the opposition pub publicly denied repeatedly ever having taken place. So I think it's equally disturbing that the Australian population we, and our history were deceived for many years until these materials came out through the archives. And when you think about it, it's, it's, it's unthinkable that the Governor-General would take an action as extreme as removing a popularly elected government without knowing that the Leader of the Opposition was prepared to step into those shoes, was prepared to take over office despite the fact that he didn't have the confidence of the House of Representatives. So there's now no doubt that Fraser did know um, most likely at least a week or two weeks prior to the dismissal of the Whitlam government. Uh, we now also know that uh, the High Court Justice, um, Sir, Sir Anthony Mason, uh, 
more than just knew, but was deeply involved in Kerr's thinking for months, for months prior to the dismissal of the government. And this is highly, highly disturbing. And this was only revealed in Gough Whitlam, his time in 2012, following the discovery I made in, in Sir John Kerr's archives of a 12-page document detailing their months of discussion and deliberations over the direction that Sir John Kerr was to take in order to dismiss the Whitlam government. Now, this is, again, extremely troubling that a sitting High Court judge could have such secret discussions with the Governor-General about removing a government in 1975. Deeply disturbing. And I think it's an enormous blemish on an otherwise, um, you know, extremely uh, honourable um, uh, legacy of Sir Anthony Mason on the High Court. Very troubling. And he has spoken himself about this subsequently and has acknowledged that if he had his time again, he would do things differently. All of this then, of course, begs the question, how much did the British monarchy know about this? If the Governor-General is acting on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen, how much do you think they knew? Well, again, I, I think that they knew a great deal. And again, we know that whatever they knew remains secret. I, I'm at the moment uh, taking a case at the federal court level to try and have those, uh, the communications between the Governor General and the palace, if you like, the Queen and her staff and uh, members of her family with the Governor General uh, revealed to the Australian public. That communication and those, uh, those letters, which are called the palace letters, uh, remain secret to us. They're secret communications at the time. Even the Prime Minister was not aware of their content. We know a little bit about them. We know that they were discussing the crisis situation, as Kerr called it, in the weeks leading up to the dismissal. But we are not allowed to view them, even though they are within our national archives. So it's interesting and, I think, troubling that whereas all of Sir John Kerr's archives is open to us, um, pursuant to the Archives Act, this one group of materials, that is the materials that are the correspondence, the letters between the Governor-General and the Queen at the time, the weeks leading up to the dismissal of the Whitlam government, are not available to us until at least 2027, and then only if the Queen's private secretary says we can have a look at them. Now, I find that an affront to us as an independent nation. I feel that we ought to have access to materials that, after all, is within our own archives, but particularly because these are critical documents in our history. As you say, what did the Queen know? How much was she aware of Sir John Kerr's thinking and intention? And it would certainly change our understanding of our role as a post-colonial nation, what we understand as an independent post-colonial nation, if we were to now find that the Queen is, is, is aware of Sir John Kerr's thinking. So I'm troubled by this, and I'm troubled enough to, to actually take that case against the archives at the federal court. It's the one remaining piece of the puzzle, I think, that we are still yet to be made aware of, and I'm hoping that we can at last see uh, precisely what Sir John Kerr was writing to the palace. It'll be interesting to see both what he tells the palace and what the palace replies and how they treat this material from Kerr. We do know from, from some short act extracts that I have found in among Sir John Kerr's papers that he was clearly putting out there to the palace the possibility that he may need to dismiss the government. There, there's no doubt about that. So what we are already, I think, finding highly disconcerting is that the palace at no point contacted Gough Whitlam and said, look, are you aware that your, that your appointed official is speaking about your government in this way, that uh, he ought to be taking your advice as, as the, the representative minister, as the responsible minister? And, and so we have a concerning situation, both in the fact that, the, that Kerr, the Governor-General, is writing in these terms to the palace, but equally that the palace is not alerting the government that such a conversation, which is already improper, is being held in secret um, and being conducted between the palace and her representative in Australia. So I'm hoping that all of that will be, uh, will be revealed by the end of this year. All of these issues, of course, then raise the question about the level of involvement of um, the British monarchy in Australian government. Do you think that then leads to the question about whether Australia should be a republic? Do you think Australia will be a republic sometime in the future? Well, the move to a, to a republic is really an inevitable one. It's a question of when. 
I think if with the release of these letters, as I hope will happen, if we see from the release of the secret correspondence between the Governor-General and the Palace at the time of the dismissal of the Whitlam Government, I think if we see some understandings reached between them, I think it would very much give uh, a greater impetus in our push towards a republic. Because the sense in which a vice-regal power existed is only one that can exist by virtue of the fact that it was still really a remnant relationship at that point between what had once been a purely colonial sort of uh, establishment uh, that still had re what Gough Whitlam would call relics of colonialism remaining in a putative power of a Governor General that really should never exist. So that question of powers of the Governor General I think is very much tied up with our the fact that we are not yet a republic and I think if we do see from those letters that there's some questionable secret communication between them, I think it would be a great push towards the move to, to a republic, which I fully expect will, will happen in the, next, in the next decade. It sounds like the Whitlam government was demonised by the Conservative parties. Would, would that be correct? Well, it was certainly an extreme reaction. I don't think we've ever seen a, a government to be under such consistent uh, um, attack, really, from, from an opposition that uh, was relentlessly obstructive in, in the Senate in the way we saw um, in 1972 to 75. I mean, the figures of the number of legislations rejected and, and, and uh, returned for, for further amendment attest to that. But coming to the period in the immediate 12 months just before the dismissal, uh, the government was under enormous um, pressure and not just from the opposition. I mean, it's many of its uh, decisions in the area of minerals and energy, for example, um, led to claims of um, impropriety. Um, uh, the media, I think, almost uh, to a newspaper, and we had many more newspapers then, were consistently um, against the policies of the Whitlam government. Uh, we had inflation rising, unemployment starting to rise. So there are a series of levels in which antagonism towards some of the policies of the government, the tariff policy of the government, for example, met a great deal of resistance where they reduced tariffs across the board. Um, and this created upheavals and I think uncertainties and, and a lot of pockets of resistance developed. So there's no doubt that by the, by the time uh, the supply bills or the money bills, which actually enable a government to continue in, 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 to, to govern because it supplies the money that, that they need on an everyday basis, by the time those bills were blocked and not voted on in the Senate, um, the political winds were changing. Um, and there were a series of claimed scandals. And of course, the opposition claimed, well, it's a scandalous government. It's, 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 it's been involved in nefarious affairs. But of course, uh, this is the claim of all oppositions against all governments, uh, particularly reforming governments. And so there was nothing, uh, in, in some, to, to some respects, nothing unusual about that. And, but what was unusual was that during the period in which supply was blocked, there's a four-week period in which those supply or money bills are returned to be voted on again and again, and they came back three times, and three times the, the vote does not continue in the Senate. Um, during that time period, opinion polls, it's very interesting to see, they actually dramatically increased support for the government for the Whitlam government. So by the time the Whitlam government has reached a decision to hold a half Senate election on the 11th of November 1975, uh, the support for the government had increased dramatically and conversely support for, the, for, for Malcolm Fraser and the opposition and particularly their tactic in the Senate had dropped considerably. So I think that it was a very difficult time on all sorts of levels for the Whitlam government and, uh, and, and, and the fact of dismissal itself came to overtake all of the things that had gone before. It changed dramatically the way in which people thought about the Whitlam government from that point on, because precisely because there'd never been a dismissal of this nature before in our history, and I doubt if there ever will be again, the uproar that surrounded that had all sorts of suggestions of impropriety on the part of the government. They must have done something horrendous to have been dismissed in this way. Sir John Kerr must know more than he's telling us. These were common themes through the media coverage that followed. And it's really only now, I think, ironically, 40 years later, that the archives are starting to open up, that I think we've had a really different picture put on the history of, of the end of the Whitlam government, if you like, and one that shows far more collusion, far more deception, and I think much more um, concerning activity on the part of all those institutional figures involved than we ever imagined before. Was this a case of the empire strikes back? <laughs> 
Look, to some extent, I think it was certainly those um, those established forces, those fighting back, that is, those forces that had controlled Australian politics for the previous 23 years. It strikes me that, that the fact of retaining office for 23 years as the Conservative parties had until 1972 is in itself a very dangerous thing for a polity. I don't think it's healthy. I think, I think you know, periods of change of government are actually not a bad thing. We need a we need to have a system that that allows for change, expects change, and in which peaceful change through the ballot box becomes an accepted part of the way we do things. Part of the problem with the 23 year period of unbroken conservative rule is that the whole post-war period, by and large, had led to a sort of default expectation that a particular way of doing things was a correct, proper and safe way of doing things. So of course a Whitlam government being so reformist and so determined to, to take action was unsettling on many levels. And I think that that, that is what struck back in 1975, is a reassertion of what uh, the official secretary, David Smith, um, the Governor-General's uh, official secretary, described as a return to the proper form you know, a return to the way things were previously, that is a conservative way. And it, it, it's troubling because of its high politicisation, particularly given that we now know that a solution had been reached with the Governor-General in the days leading up to 1975, that is calling a half-Senate election. And Whitlam should have gone to that half-Senate election. It should have been called by the Governor-General and things would have been very different had that proper process been followed. Well, this was Australia's own little coup by the sound of it. Jenny, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks very much. Been a pleasure, Susan. Thank you. The Whitlam government was removed before it could achieve its vision for a new Australia. And that government was removed in an atmosphere of intrigue and scandal. But it's important to remember the optimism of 1972 when Labor briefly came to power after two decades of Conservative rule. This clip from Australia's National Film and Sound Archives takes us right back to the hustings. Australian Labour Party.